And it is my pleasure to invite to the stage the Honourable Rob Stokes, who of course is the New South Wales Minister for Planning, and he's going to be in conversation with the Western Sydney Leadership Dialogue Executive Director, Adam Leto. And of course, as the husband of the current New South Wales Planner of the Year, I will be reporting back. But gentlemen, please join me on the stage. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Adam Leto and Rob Stokes. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, I've got the pleasure of introducing the Minister for Planning and Public Spaces, Rob Stokes, a man who's been a strong supporter of the dialogue for the last five years, both in his role of uh, Minister for Education and Planning. Um, more importantly, during his time in government, what we've seen is someone who's demonstrated a sensible and uh, considered approach to policy development, and uh, one that's largely centred around communities and collaboration. And, as Christopher Brown touched on earlier, we're big fans of him at the dialogue. So um, in addition to proving that he's a willing listener, he's also shown that he's prepared to take on the big issues. Um, he even took on young Greta Thunberg earlier this year, um, which takes some doing. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Minister Rob Stokes. Now, Minister, I was going to hit you up first up with um, a point around urban heating and water, which has been in the news a bit lately, but I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, I want to start on population. Uh, it's a big one for Western Sydney. Um, often when we talk about our, our planning, our development, our infrastructure investment, a lot of it is predicated on population growth, um, which by all, all forecasts is indicated to be rapidly expanding over the next 20 years. Um, but I want to point to some of the comments you made earlier this year where you touched on a um, few of the challenges our demographers have had um, in predicting population, um, for instance. And I'll, I'll point to these, these uh, messages that you, you referenced in your, in your article. Um, the 1948 Cumberland Plan, for instance, which assumed our population would reach 2.25 million by 1981. Uh, we achieved that by 1961. The Sydney Region Outline Plan of 1968 projected Sydney's population to reach 5.5 million mm. and we haven't got there yet. Mm. And that was by 19, was it 1981. So we're 30 years behind, 40 years behind. Basic point is we've guessed short, we've guessed long. The only consistency when it comes to projecting population is that we always get it wrong. Um, knowing what we currently know, and you obviously being the person responsible for trying to plan for this city, how do you make confident informed decisions, planning decisions, with any great assurance? And secondly, what can we do to try and improve the accuracy around population forecasting? Well, thanks, Adam. I mean, the first comment is planning is prophecy. You, you, you actually making, you, 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 I mean, the process is the process by which we as a society make choices about our future. And we have to do that based on, uh, on the best available information. That's why I've been uh, calling on the federal government to, uh, to, to adopt a national settlement strategy. Mm -hmm. so, so once they've decided what population targets are going to be, then we can talk as a nation about those areas that we believe are strategically important mm -hmm. uh, to grow. There are some things that are going to happen regardless. We know that Sydney is one of the top 10 uh, among the developed nations, one of the, uh, the the, the fastest 10 growing cities anywhere in the world, and that is likely to continue. Um, what we know about our population projections is, in, over recent years, they've been too conservative, and that's likely to continue. Uh, the biggest driver of population growth in Sydney continues to be immigration, mm -hmm. and uh, and despite some uh, some some rhetoric from the federal government in relation to easing um, uh, immigration, the reality is that that's not really happening, uh, and. Uh, but, uh, so growth brings with it its challenges, but I don't think it's necessarily something we should be scared of. Mm. <clears throat> um, certainly, I think the alternative of growth is far more scary for people mm -hmm. uh, because you see those cities where population is falling are those cities uh, with poor social outcomes, uh, with high rates of crime, uh, high rates of disadvantage and inequality. Uh, so growth can actually be a great thing and it's certainly better than the alternative. Those issues you just touched on, particularly the social issues. Um, I know you, you know our stuck in the middle paper. I've no, seen well. you photographed in the Telegraph repeatedly with it. Yeah. Um, some of those issues exist in that central city, that, that sort of corridor between from the hills up north down through Parramatta, Westmead, down through Cumberland, and 
to Bankstown and Hurstville. Um, population, yeah, yeah, I think that corridor alone is expected to take on 50% of Sydney's population over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, given this area has sort of been affected by sort of poor planning decisions in the past, you know, sometimes even corrupt decisions. We've had some you know, bad councils there, but that's turned the corner. Um, how do, what are we doing to ensure future development within that, that corridor is, is designed well, is, is considered, and, and also prioritises the need for, for public spaces, which I know is you know, a nice addition to your new portfolio? Well, the, the, the first... Really, first, second, and third answer is jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ultimately all about redistributing access to high quality jobs right across the fabric of Sydney. Uh, for too long, uh, we've had a model that's been concentric in the way we've planned, which is all the jobs have been on the eastern seaboard uh, and everyone else has been relegated to dormitory suburbs for, for, for workers to travel all the way east. Uh, that model uh, is broken and can't continue. Uh, the reason I say it's broken is it leads to dysfunction in terms of people having ever longer commutes on more and more congested uh, uh, route modes of travel. Mm. Uh, the long-term transport master plan indicates that uh, you know, our travel demand has already grown dramatically over the past few years, which is exciting because it shows more people if in public transport, for example, more and more people are choosing public transport. Uh, but the trajectory of growth uh, is as a modal share that's likely to increase another 50% over the next 20 years. Uh, so, uh, so we can't have uh, transport routes taking everyone from across mm. uh, Sydney all into the eastern harbour city. Yeah. Uh, and so jo jobs is the, the, the first, second, third answer and everything else fo yeah. flows from that. You mentioned transport um, and we had Minister Constance up here earlier talking about you know, some of the priorities that he's, he's working on at the moment. First one obviously being Metro West. Metro West. Um, it's not just about transport. Planning has a big role to play in it, particularly around the precinct development and the renewal opportunities around some of the stations. Can you talk us through what you'd like to see, particularly on, along that route um, from Westmead through, through to Piermont, as it stands, about some of the opportunities for, for reshaping some of those areas? Well, it's not just about the east-west links. And from a transport perspective, that is really important. And I certainly uh, endorse strongly uh, Andrew's commitment, not just to the, the Western Metro, but also to keeping that connection to 20 minutes. I think that's a really, really critical thing. And we've got to be very careful uh, to, to ensure that we keep that route fast. Uh, but uh, it's also about the north-south links. And some exa examples in the... Um, uh, in, in terms of connecting communities that have been split by Parramatta Road or, or by those sorts of um, uh, transport connections, a good example would be the, the Greenway from Iron Cove to Cooks River, an example of, 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 of activating a forgotten space, the Hawthorne Canal, uh, as, as, a, as a green link to link communities. What fascinated me when I was looking at uh, the West Connects approval uh, some years ago was uh, the traffic modelling showed that the bulk of, uh, of, of private vehicle uh, movements along Parramatta Road were less than five kilometres. Mm. I think it's about something like 50% of trips. Uh, and, uh, and so many of those trips are unnecessary. Uh, but of course, because the connections are so unpleasant for pedestrians, uh, people will just get in their cars. So we need to make those very short journeys much more accessible for people to ride or to walk, mm. uh, to pedestrianise those areas, to take unnecessary car trips off the road. On North South, one of the, the, the projects we've been sort of advocating for and championing is that North South rail link between sort of North Castle Hill running through Parramatta down to Hurstville Cogra. Transport strategy currently indicates that it's a 20, 25 year plus project. Um, is that something you'd like to see moved up, reprioritised? I think across government, I mean, obviously we agree on our priorities and then we all get behind them. Um, when we look at our um, long-term transport master planning, it also allows the flexibility to change over time. That's why planning is an iterative ongoing process. So we put out our plans uh, and then we have the flexibility to change them depending upon uh, uh, on need into the future. That link is a tricky one because it's already highly developed and so there's quite a lot of constraints. Uh, and part of, the, uh, part of the importance of long-term planning is to identify corridors where we need to restrict certain types, types of development, which I know can be very frustrating uh, to, to landowners, mm -hmm. but is absolutely imperative in the long-term public interest. Yep.
I said I'd get to the environment and urban heating, water management, um, climate change, it's all been fairly topical and rightly so over the past couple of weeks. Um, urban heating when it comes to Western Sydney has been an issue for, for a number of years now. Um, it's starting to get more, more awareness. Um, approaching summer we're, we're going to be hitting temperatures where it's 15 degrees in some parts of Western Sydney beyond uh, compared to some other parts of Sydney. Um, I know that the government's taken some, some leading role in being able to, you know, I think Premier's priorities introduced 5 million trees by 2030, a number of other measures currently being looked at. Um, outside of the, the tree planting, which we know is important, um, what is, what's your plan to address some of the sustainability concerns in Western Sydney? Uh, well, uh, I've got two uh, particular priorities that the Premier has given me. Uh, one relates to planting trees, uh, so 5 million by 2030, 1 million by 2022, uh, but also increasing access to, uh, to public, usable, open, accessible open space uh, by, uh, by 10% um, over the next, um, uh, sorry, ex increase the number of homes that are within 10 minutes walk of, uh, of, of usable public open space um, uh, by 2023. So they're two quantitative targets that I'm expected to achieve, which mean that we're going to really need to think carefully about our public open spaces and mm. accessibility to them. Uh, but you mentioned um, the urban heat island effect, which is very real, mm. and uh, and tree planning is obviously the obvious is obviously the, the the clearest way to address it. That's really tricky currently with water restrictions and mm. the reality of drought. So embedded in that are your calls for uh, improved uh, uh, water sensitive yep. urban design. Right. Uh, that's critical uh, to improve uh, recycling rates in Sydney. The challenge of course is that has a cost implication for households. Mm. Uh, it means that water, uh, if, uh, if we're going to make recycling schemes feasible, uh, it means that water will go up a little bit in cost mm. to, uh, to ensure that, uh, uh, that that's feasible. That's being looked at at the moment, uh, but obviously water recycling is something we should have been doing a lot more of yep. and we need to do a lot more into the future. Yep. And yeah, definitely a round of applause. <laughs> we've 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 flagged that with the premier last night, um, and was fairly well received. She did indicate that there's some work being looked at at the moment. Um, so hopefully, some news in the next few months on that. Um, you mentioned design, and one of the things I have to mention is that I think it's a great move um, to have the public spaces added to to planning, long overdue. Um, and I can tell you're passionate about, which is which is great. But um, Western Sydney, you could argue, has, has been let down in the past when it comes to development that's probably more focused on buildings rather than places and people. Um, what are you doing? What would you like to see happen in Western Sydney to deliver better, more accessible, more activated spaces um, with a stronger commitment to design? Yeah. Well, Adam, this is a call to arms for everyone in the room uh, because design is something like with water recycling, there's a cost associated with it over the short term. But over the longer term, the dividends to everyone uh, are extraordinary and enormous. And I find often, I find it's the economists who sort of argue against design because design um, can add to short term costs. And so you th see things like the apartment design design guide, for example, coming under fire because it increases the cost of apartments. Uh, but when you, but that might be true over the very short term, but over the longer term, great urban design makes everyone's lives better. It's, it's a classic example of a public good. We all, um, you know, it, we, we are all affected by the design of the built environment, so it matters to, to, to everyone. Uh, and, uh, and a couple of things that we, we need to do as part of that, um, well, certainly the way the government is addressing this is we've mandated uh, great urban design. It's now one of the objects of our planning system. Uh, one of, uh, so we introduced some changes to planning laws last year. And uh, in one sense, it's extraordinary that urban design or great quality urban design was not something the planning system insisted upon in the past. Uh, and we're living with the legacy of that, but it is now mandated in law that uh, good quality urban design and the built environment are, th are objects of our planning law. Uh, and through our local strategic planning statements, councils are now looking at how they can enforce design rules. And so we need to work together to make sure that we insist upon good quality urban design. Uh, and, uh, and, and what I would like to see is development that actually contributes to an area. In the past, often the model with some speculative developers was to effectively take 
uh, from, uh, from the good design elements around and use them to try and uh, increase the value of whatever it was they were building. But instead, let's turn that on its head and instead, uh, as a community, uh, look for ways in which our developments can actually improve the design outcomes of the surrounding areas. And that's the best way in which we can explain to the community the benefits of development, because if it makes uh, their areas better designed and more accessible, which we know it can, uh, then let's do it. Melbourne is often tossed up as a global example of design done well, um, and Sydney's doing a fairly good job of it too, I'd, I'd imagine. But Western Sydney, the environment's a little bit different less urbanised, how do you take those principles and apply them to uh, sort of a less urbanised area like parts of Western Sydney? Well, so, I mean, it, it, there's, um, it's always a, a, a mix of challenge and opportunity. Um, Western Sydney uh, is going to continue to remain reasonably low density, um, and that's just because of the scale, uh, the, the uh, a consequence of its scale and its size. So overall, the long-term transport master plan tells us that Sydney's density is going to go from from about 410 people per square kilometre to about 610 people per square kilometre over the next, uh, until 2056. Uh, so that sounds like a huge increase in density, but when you consider that uh, Paris, for example, has a density at the moment of about 6,000 people per square kilometre, you realise that it's a very low density city by global terms. So that gives us a lot of flexibility um, about putting density in particular areas uh, and, uh, and having lo lower densities in other areas. Of course, as our cities become more dense, design matters more and more because it's more and more obvious to more people. Uh, and the way in which we can do it is first to start with landscape elements. So tree planting is critical uh, and uh, in ensuring that we've got those leafy boulevards uh, and, and, and cool places. That's, the, that's where we need to start with. Uh, so certainly something that I'm already talking to the development community about, and particularly in Western Sydney where often uh, land holdings are aggregated and, and not as fragmented, there's great opportunities to master plan areas so that we can put in the street network, put in the trees now uh, in, in anticipation of the developments that are to come. I'm going to wrap up with a bit of a discussion around federal policy, um, one that I think is connected to you, around uh, the current Scott Morrison's view on uh, planning for Australia's future population and his decentralisation view around moving people to the outskirts of city centres. Um, we've seen the issues in Western Sydney where you know, communities are being built outside of centres that are disconnected from the rest of the city and we've got the 30 minute city that um, New South Wales government's committed to which is great. Um, but is this federal approach to decentralisation um, sort of consistent with you know, what we're seeing um, from the state government's perspective and do you think it's a sustainable approach? Well, there are global trends we're looking at as well, and globally, more and more people want to live in cities. Uh, so, uh, and we're in a liberal democracy, people can live and should be able to live wherever the hell they want to live, mm. and, uh, and we should celebrate that, and we should, um, we should create opportunities for people to live wherever it is they want to. We know that more and more, as I've mentioned, more and more people are going to want to live uh, toward cities, but of course what we mean by cities is changing over time. In the past we talked about city regions being sort of a conurbation from say Newcastle to Wollongong, mm -hmm. but increasingly city regions are now vast. We're starting to talk about a city region from, from Shanghai to Singapore. So in the Australian context that's a city region from, from Brisbane to, to Geelong, or Townsville to Geelong. And it's so, so you know, you can incorporate a lot of decentralisation when you're talking about a city region of that scale. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, in the past, when we've talked about economic agglomeration, which is what all the economists want in terms of driving better productivity, density has been the proxy to get a, a agglomeration that we've all had to live on top of one another. Increasingly, we can also agglomeration through connectivity. Uh, people don't necessarily need to live on top of one another, provided they're well connected. So that's the genius of the 30 minute city. That's talking about transport connectivity, but we can also talk about digital connectivity as well. Mm. And I think one of the big disruptive elements that will be quite exciting to see unfold into the future is uh, we're planning for cities where everyone lives close together. One of the big disruptive things that who knows what the future might hold is we might actually go back to a situation where people can live further apart 
but be better connected than ever before. So that's one of the things we've got to keep uh, in the back of our minds as something that, that might happen. It's interesting, you go 100 years ago and the, the catch cry of the Town Planning Association was nothing gained through overcrowding. And it was planning was all about trying to spread people away from the cities. 100 years later, it's about trying to bring people back in. Uh, who knows what the trend in the future might be? Uh, but something that we need to plan for in the meantime, and part of my public spaces role, and I've just uh, uh, heard that uh, apparently uh, when uh, the Premier announced that there was going to be a Minister for Public Spaces, that's the first such Minister anywhere in the world. So that's something we should be pretty proud of because it's, it puts a real focus uh, that as Sydney continues to grow, uh, the emphasis needs to be on public space just as much as the, as the areas we build on. Minister, there's no doubt you're creating history, one building at a time. Congratulations, um, and all the work you're doing in, in the portfolio I think is great, and like I said, the dialogue, big supporters of what you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Minister Stokes. Thank you. Thank you.